Hello everyone and welcome to the second session of our online event marking the launch of CDSB's latest review of environmental and climate related disclosure by Europe's largest companies under the Non-Financial Reporting Directive. My name is Martin O'Brien and I'm the Managing Director here at CDSB. For those new to CDSB and weren't joining us for this morning's session, our work um, is all centred around us being a consortium of business and environmental NGOs set up at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2007. And we worked to integrate consistent, comparable, decision useful information on climate and environmental information into companies' mainstream reports with the same rigor as financial information. We are supported by a group of talented individuals via our technical working group. And I know a few of you are on the webinar today, so a huge thank you for all of your support. We do appreciate it. So today, I'm joined with a few of my talented colleagues from the CDSB team. I'm going to take a quick moment to introduce them, and then we'll launch right into the substance of the webinar. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Fiona Quinlan, the lead author of the report and CDSB's technical manager. And she's going to take us through the findings of the report. Fiona has been with us uh, for just under a year and comes to us bringing expertise from sustainability and non-financial reporting, both from within a company and as a consultant helping others. We'll also be joined by Nontokozo Kumalo, and apologies for the pronunciation, and she's our corporate engagement manager at CDSB, and she's going to take us through uh, the good practice recommendations for companies on how to improve your reporting in line with the non-financial reporting directive. Nonto also joined us last year, and uh, she has a background in asset management, banking and insurance sectors. Um, in the corporate governance, client relationship management and sustainability functions. And just in case we need some policy uh, reference points on the non-financial reporting directive and other policies related to the work we're talking about today, Michael Zimini, uh, CDSB's Global Policy and External Affairs Director, um, is also on the line. He's not presenting, but he's here just in case we have any tricky questions as I said, we need to call him up on. He's also a member of the FRAG European lab project um, task force on climate related reporting and also the UK's financial reporting council stakeholder advisory panel. So as we touched on earlier, we hosted a policy session earlier today with Ellen Deckers and Morgan Dupre. Um, and the recording is available on our website. So that was a really po policy focused webinar on um, talking about how the um, how the falling short report um, could help provide policy uh, evidence to support the policy making process. Um, this afternoon's webinar is much more corporate and action focused. So we'll be talking about the report and then talking more about, a bit more about um, the how to and what does it look like of non-financial reporting. So without further ado, um, I'm going to sort out why my camera doesn't connect and I'm going to hand it across to Fiona who's going to take us through some key findings of the report with so over to you, Fiona. Great, thank you, Mardi, and great to have you all on the webinar today. So thank you for joining us. So I wanted to provide a brief overview of the key findings from our review. Um, now, for those of you who may have had the opportunity to join our policy focus session this morning, uh, this will cover some familiar ground. However, for those joining us uh, for this session only, we wanted to ensure a common understanding um, and then also cover some additional detail and aspects that we thought would be of most interest for corporates as well. So um, listen in. So the review forms part of a four-year project uh, CDSB is currently undertaking with the support of the EU LIFE programme. So the project aims to bring natural capital and environmental information into the heart of financial decision making. And over the course of the project, we're aiming to conduct three annual climate and environmental reviews uh, under the Non-Financial Reporting Directive with two key aims. So the first is to provide an evidence base on the state of environment and climate related disclosure under the NFRD providing recommendations to policy makers to support the improvement of the directive. And we're also aiming to identify and share good practices to support companies in improving the reporting under the directive, which is what we're focusing on in today's session particularly. So the review considered reports released in 2019 covering the 2018 financial year. We reviewed the 50 largest listed companies in Europe, representing eight jurisdictions as shown on the screen below and a range of sectors from both the financial and the real economy. So these companies have a combined market capitalization of 4.3 trillion US dollars, 
so they do represent a sizable share of the overall European economy. And our approach consisted of a qualitative and quantitative question set uh, used by our review team who read through each company's report in detail to assess current practices. It considers the specific aspects of environment and climate disclosure under the core content categories of the directive. So that's business model, KPIs, policies and due diligence outcomes and principal risks, as well as the TCSE recommendations. So mainstream reports such as annual reports and accounts or registration documents were reviewed in the first instance, with other reports reviewed if they were clearly signposted from the mainstream reports or if they were the primary location for non-financial disclosure under the directive. So now onto a summary of the findings. So on the screen, you'll see a summary of each content category of the directive, as well as some of the specific aspects that were built into our question sets around issues such as materiality. So the overall picture that we see is one of improved disclosure um, compared to our first review of disclosure published in late 2018. So the vast majority of companies in the sample are now providing some disclosure against all of the required content elements. Whilst this is therefore positive, the fact however does remain that environmental and climate information under the EU NFRD is still falling short of providing investors with the quality, comparability and consistency, as well as coherence, that they need to be able to fully integrate these matters into their decision making. So I'll now walk you through an overview of each of the findings for the different aspects that we've shown below. So starting out with business models, we found that 88% are now referencing environment or climate to some extent within their business models, which demonstrates a growth from our, our first review. However, when we look in detail at the references to climate and environment made within business models, we found that only a majority, 34%, are able to provide a full and clear picture that provides company and context specific information to enable a full understanding of how, and how our environmental matters are integrated into the business model. So, for example, they would consider both environmental and climate related inputs, outputs, and interactions. However, often disclosures were quite a lot more high level than this, uh, perhaps only stating the importance of environment and climate for the business without necessarily explaining what that means specifically for the company in question. Where business model disclosures are made, 75% included this information within their main business model description. So the one that kind of uh, sits at the front of their mainstream report for the overall business strategy. However, others chose to prepare a separate statement uh, elsewhere in their report addressing non-financial or environmental business model aspects specifically. Overall, we observed that the disclosures that were integrated um, alongside the wider strategic information in the mainstream report typically gave the most clarity, particularly where diagrams and illustrations were perhaps used to support this. So now turning to the closely linked aspects of policies, due diligence and outcomes. Overall, we saw very high levels of disclosure with over 90% of companies disclosing environment and climate information on each of these aspects. However, where we still saw challenges was in the level of subject matter specificity surrounding these disclosures and the differing ways in which these requirements are currently being interpreted. So for example, some companies provided only very high level policies such as stating uh, a broad commitment to minimizing environmental impact. Similarly, while 64% did disclose board and management level due diligence aspects, some perhaps focused more on uh, operational or localized level controls and procedures, which perhaps might be less relevant um, for inclusion in the mainstream reports. So this suggests that perhaps there's some confusion over the correct definition and interpretation of these terminologies at the moment. Furthermore, the degree of connection between these different aspects varied and sometimes it wasn't clear. So the best disclosures really did demonstrate quite a strong linkage between each of these aspects, which enabled a good clarity and focus to reporting where it was done. Outcomes was an area where disclosures were often of a more narrative nature and a key area where reporting could actually be quite lengthy and perhaps um, less concise. So the strongest disclosures that we observed tended to focus outcomes reporting on progress against clear commitments such as time-bound targets and where this was done it led to good coherence and, and conciseness. However, it was often the case that disclosures were more freeform or didn't easily group key information which made it challenging to both find and compare between companies. So turning to principal risk disclosures, uh, this is another area where specific challenges were identified in our review. So at a basic level, 90% uh, of companies did disclose at least one principal risk relating to 
time or environment. However, only just over half considered the two main risk types within the GCSE recommendations. So that's physical risks and transition risks. Uh, additionally, companies often failed to draw a clear distinction between risks derived from the company's impact on the environment and climate and risks that the business itself would face in relation to these aspects, with the business risk angle less commonly addressed. So for example, 18% uh, didn't disclose any business-related impacts associated with the risks they reported, and under half uh, disclosed the overall impact of risks on their business model. And whilst we did see that 78% uh, referenced financial impact, this disclosure was usually in qualitative in nature. And then considering the time horizon of this current risk disclosure, so only 6% identified how risks identified would impact the business over the short, medium and long term. So overall, while risk is a key area of focus under the NFRD and TCFD, it's evident that there's further efforts required to improve disclosures overall in this regard. Uh, in fact, principal risk disclosures under the NFRD were often addressed quite separately to TCFD and indeed perhaps to principal financial risk disclosures. So at times this could lead to some duplication and inconsistencies in reporting. So on KPIs, um, we saw a good level of disclosure on the core aspects, such as greenhouse gas emissions, water and energy, with the vast majority of companies disclosing metrics in these areas. However, there were still challenges that we saw in the degree of consistency and comparability between companies reporting in this area. So for example, whilst all companies disclose greenhouse gas emissions, only just over half provided disclosure on scope three, wider value chain emissions and another quarter didn't provide sufficient clarity over the emission scopes to enable uh, comparability between companies. Additionally, a uh, clear linkage between policies and KPIs uh, sometimes wasn't apparent. So where present, um, this provided a really helpful uh, kind of transparency in terms of progress and performance, um, and it helped to structure the overall disclosure well. However, often indicators may have been disclosed without clarity over whether they related to the previously mentioned policy commitments, which did create challenges, obviously, in, in following that link through the reporting. Additionally, we found that reporting on climate-related me financial metrics, so that's those metrics which try to draw a more clear link between uh, non-financial and financial performance, so uh, aspects such as revenue from low-carbon products or capital expenditure uh, on climate mitigation were not commonly disclosed with only a third of companies uh, addressing that type of metric at the moment. The integration of qualitative criteria into remuneration uh, is growing in 30% of the companies used. So overall, while KPIs uh, are a strong area for some companies, the ability to compare the KPIs across them is currently quite limited due to the differing methodologies and indicators that we used. So this is something um, that really needs to be address, addressed to help improve uh, stakeholder usability of this information. So we also looked uh, specifically at TCFD disclosure, um, and we find that overall uh, progress and adoption of the TCFD recommendations still appears to be somewhat limited in Europe's large companies. So finance and energy sector companies uh, reviewed typically did demonstrate reasonable progress in adopting the recommendations. However, this was usually the exception in companies in other sectors, uh, with some providing no aligned disclosure at all. Particularly looking at the strategy pillar of TCFD and the use of scenario analysis to disclose uh, strategic resilience, uh, we found that only 14% of companies are currently doing this effectively. We also found that TCFD disclosure was more commonly provided outside of the report in a separate uh, climate, climate change or sustainability report. And overall, that the degree of linkage companies are making between their NFRD disclosures and TCFD is currently quite limited. So TCFD is usually addressed separately if it is considered. And some companies, in fact, we found in their NFRD disclosures didn't make any real reference to climate change directly at all. So that leads us to, to feel that the broader requirement uh, within the directive to disclose environmental matters uh, isn't necessarily making it clear for companies that that would specifically include climate change as well. So we also looked at the approaches companies are taking to materiality with regards to environment and climate information. So the NFRD introduced the concept of double materiality, so that's considering both the inward-looking impacts of the company or financial materiality, 
as well as the business's outward looking impact on the environment, so environmental or non-financial materiality. So we wanted to understand uh, how and indeed if this is currently being applied and practiced by companies. And we found that one in three companies uh, didn't actually provide clarity on the materiality of their environmental reporting and that where they did, the majority currently apply a, a focus on the environmental materiality lens in their disclosure. So only a small proportion were clearly applying the double materiality uh, kind of outlined within the directive or an investor focus to financial materiality in the mainstream reports. So additionally, when materiality assessments were disclosed, sometimes the actual linkage from the assessment to disclosure practices wasn't necessarily apparent. So for example, companies may subsequently have reported on topics that they didn't highlight in their materiality assessment, or perhaps didn't emphasize those that they did. Overall, we also found that 42% of companies omitted potentially material information. So that's environmental topics other companies in their sector identified as material. And that 30% potentially included immaterial information. So that might have been unnecessary detail or information that they themselves had stated not to be material in their own assessments. So this shows that overall that there's a need for clear application of materiality to environmental and climate reporting to help it uh, really be decision useful for investors. So turning to the final aspect that I wanted to share from our review, uh, which was where and how NFRD disclosures are currently being made. Overall, we found that 84% uh, were predominantly reporting uh, the NFRD information within their mainstream reports. And where the information was provided elsewhere, we often found it harder to locate, or perhaps it was split between different reports, which made it hard to kind of clarify the connections between the different elements of the content. Where disclosure was provided in the mainstream reports, both integration within different sections of the report, so for example, uh, risk and corporate governance, and also the opposing practice of publishing a standalone non-financial statement within the mainstream report um, were equally common. And where information was integrated, uh, often reference or signposting tables were used, which could be a helpful way um, of signposting the relevant content. So the overall length of environment and climate disclosure varied quite significantly between the reports. So we saw as little as one page in the mainstream report and as many as 70. So in fact, it was quite interesting to see that some of the most succinct disclosures that we saw really ran to much more uh, shorter lengths, such as five to ten pages. So it does show that actually less can be more in this space. So that provides you with a brief overview of some of the key areas for improvement identified in our review. To sum up, we see the need for improvement in the overall uptake of NFRD disclosure but that that has improved since prior years. So it's positive that more companies are, are providing this, but ultimately we believe that it's falling short of providing investors with the kind of information they need on climate and environment. Key kinds of issues that we identified here include the need for consistency between companies and for increased adherence in company disclosures under the different content categories of the directive. It's also evident that climate-related disclosure aligned to TCFD isn't yet commonplace and is often considered in isolation to other non-financial reporting requirements. Additionally, the application of differing materiality approaches and an overall lack of clarity currently provided by companies on materiality of environment and climate information needs to improve. And finally, the disclosure of principal risks relating to climate and environment requires particular attention to ensure that companies are considering both the impacts on the environment and the impacts of their business to provide a holistic view. So that concludes my summary of the findings. So clearly there wasn't time to cover every aspect in detail today, um, so I'd really encourage you to take a look at the reports or to get in touch if there's any particular areas that you wanted to know more about. So thanks for that, and I'll hand over to Nanta Kobo now, who's going to share some of the good practice tips for companies. Thank you. Just quickly, it's Marda here. Before you hand over, Fiona, there's just two quick questions in the chat, which I think it makes sure. sense to cover now. Um, what is the consumer staples category that you referenced? Can you please provide some clarification on that? Uh, so going back to the industry sectors, so um, I think it's kind of a standard approach to classification would have consumer staples and consumer discretionary. So uh, there's quite a lot of overlap, but I guess broadly speaking, staples are more uh, everyday goods such as uh, household cleaning products or basic foodstuffs um, with the luxury, sorry, luxury goods being more of the, the discretionary side of things. So uh, typically it uh, could be large companies that, that sell multiple kind of food and, and toiletry products. Great. 
Thank you for that. And just the last one, just to just put all this in, in context, I guess, before we move on with Montecozo. Um, and I and I could probably add to this, but I'm going to get you to do it. Why are there no companies from Eastern European, Eastern Europe in our sample? Yeah, so because we took the approach in this review of focusing on the largest companies by market capitalization, uh, that did mean that it was it was more focused on the larger economies within Europe. Um, but as we said, those 50 companies uh, represent in themselves uh, a very sizable share of the European economy. And also, uh, we felt that focusing on the largest companies and really seeing if they were managing the disclosure effectively would be a good indication of general disclosure. And clearly, we see that there's, there's still challenges for those large companies who are perhaps likely to be better resourced and to produce high quality reporting. So if we see challenges there, I think we can we can say that those challenges exist elsewhere too. Um, but I think we, we would see this exercise as kind of complementary to, to the work of other bodies, such as the Alliance for Corporate Transparency, who did um, another review, and they kind of focus more on that Eastern European market. So we intend really for these insights to be kind of complementary to the work of others who are also sort of focusing on those jurisdictions too. Great, thanks for those clarifications, Fiona. Keep your questions coming in. There's a few more that are a bit more generic, so we'll address them um, a bit further down this, this schedule. But now over to you, Nonte, to cover the recommendations for report preparers on how to improve reporting in line with the Non-Financial Reporting Directive. Thank you, Marty, and uh, thank you, Fiona, for that uh, presentation, just to set the background. So now that everyone has heard the findings and uh, what the company is actually disclosing, I think it's a good time now for us to start to look at some good practice tips and ways in which companies can actually address the gaps that Fiona has already um, spoken about. So starting with the business model, as Fiona has already mentioned, a lot of the business model disclosures with regards to climate and environmental impact were actually at a high level and not very detailed. So what we encourage companies to do is to provide meaningful context. So go into a deep detail. And some of the ways to achieve that is maybe uh, including a diagrammatic representation of the business model, so showing inputs, outputs, and impact on the organization. And then another way is also to show, um, in addition to financial value that is created by the business, also show economic, social, and environmental values of society. This actually encourages companies to actually um, think about these issues in a holistic way by including all of these aspects. And then um, a lot of the time we find companies also um, providing information about the business model that is quite generic. So we encourage companies to really um, articulate um, issues such as relating to their products, services and related. And then another um, aspect that we liked where some companies actually um, at, at described all the, the ESG trends, such as uh, regulation that may be impacting their sector. So this is actually something good to elaborate on. And a good practice example that we actually um, liked when we were conducting the review was that of any. Any actually provided a description of the trends that are affecting the energy sector, the sector that they operate in. And then they also then um, spoke about how they actually address all the, 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 all the issues that they've actually highlighted with regards to the trends. And then they, as I mentioned, they actually have a diagrammatic representation of all the inputs and outputs and how these um, impact um, their business model. Mm -hmm. Then moving on to policies and due diligence. One aspect about policies and due diligence that Fiona has already also highlighted is that policies are sometimes um, a brief. There were a lot of times companies actually don't go into detail with regards to the actions relating to those policies and there was not enough context uh, provided. So we encourage companies again to provide um, ambition statements that are linked to these policies and also and also um, the targets and qualitative targets and quantitative targets that are linked to um, these ambition statements so that uh, they can be assessed over time. And then another aspect relates to um, the structure um, and how actually this can be structured using policies and linking this information in a connected way, interconnected way, and we encourage companies to, to do that with regards to all the areas in their reporting. And then we also noted that um, 
companies often did not disclose both the board level and management level accountabilities regarding environmental and climate related matters. And we encourage companies to actually show all these aspects in order to, to be able to show the connectivity between these various areas. And then another aspect we'd like to recommend companies do is to also show the linkages between the due diligence arrangements and the policies that um, they've actually uh, highlighted. So a lot of the time, the due diligence arrangements are actually shown in a separate area of the reporting in the corporate governance uh, report. So we encourage companies to actually show this information together so that it encourages the coherency with regards to when, uh, when report readers are actually looking at the report and they see where, how all the issues are linked. And then moving, moving on to outcomes, one aspect that we noted um, was relates to, relates to how policies were, offered, were, were actually not referred to with regards to the outcomes. So there was no link between the outcomes and the stated policy objectives. So we encourage companies to, to link these outcomes that they, they disclose in their reporting to the policies to avoid these um, outcomes being just a list of good news stories without being linked to overall ambition. And then another um, recommendation we'd like to make is that companies actually also um, disclose with regarding to progress um, updates with regards to that particular year and um, clearly defined uh, objectives over time. A lot of the time companies just list um, updates and they, and they don't actually reference it to a broader um, target or ambition over time. And this just looks like just a list of, um, again, good news stories. And then um, sometimes companies actually um, included a lot of narrative, uh, narrative in their reporting, which made the reports quite lengthy. And we'd like to encourage companies actually provide summaries and uh, bullet points to actually make it easier for the reader to actually go through the information and understand what the key outcomes are. And then moving on to a good practice example with regards to this aspect. So ASMA Holdings did exactly what I mentioned uh, before. They actually provided a table showing all their, their outcomes and how they performed um, against uh, specific objectives and targets, which really gave a good view of what the progress was with regards to climate and environmental aspects. And then with regards to principal risk, um, one aspect that we, we did note is that a lot of the time the risks were listed in a very um, generic manner. So there are no specifics with regards to um, the impact on the operations, business model and financial performance. Again, business model was actually the least um, disclosed aspect with regards to this impact. So we encourage companies to really be specific around this impact to encourage um, a more decision usefulness um, of the information. And then um, an issue that we, we was highlighted by Fiona was again the issue of the time horizon. So we encourage companies to actually talk about the risk in relation to the short, medium, and the long-term time horizon. And, um, and then the third point on principal risk is that um, these risks are better linked to um, the policies and the and due diligence aspects and outcomes in order to for the reader to actually understand the full um, impact and how this actually impacts the overall business and other aspects. And then a good practice example that we actually liked was um, the caring um, disclosure on principal risk. They speak about the likelihood, that, well, they mention the likelihood and they also cover the impact severity with regards to climate change risk. And then they also go through all the potential impacts on the operational areas of the business. So you really give a full description of, of what the impacts are with regards to climate change specifically. And then um, moving on to KPIs. KPIs um, was actually um, obviously one of those that are very, um, the disclosures that are quite mature, but then we also observed that there was quite a bit of uh, variance with this, in this regard. And we encourage companies to make the information more comparable by showing at least um, a minimum of two years prior data to enable performance trends to be assessed over time. 
And then uh, we also encourage companies to actually distinguish between the KPIs relating to um, the, the KPIs relating to climate related issues and environmental issues, and then the, with, um, the broader distinguish between those and the broader um, indicators of the business so that um, report readers can actually understand what, which are the priority matrix for the business. And then again, um, similarly to, to the outcomes, we encourage companies to actually summarize these KPIs in a table to make it easier for these to be identified and, and uh, assessed by, by the report readers. And uh, finally, on KPIs, um, linking the KPIs to the outcomes is, um, is very important. And again, as I mentioned, the outcomes then are linked to policies. So really providing that full picture is something that we encourage companies to do so that uh, report readers can actually analyze the, the reports um, in a holistic manner. And then an example that we liked was uh, that of Airbus, where all the KPIs are summarized in a uh, well in a table and showing prior year performance. And also they have all their GHG emissions from scope one, two, and three, and which is something that uh, we noted that sometimes companies don't have uh, the scope three emissions or they don't clearly show which are the differences between all the various scopes, the three scopes. And then with regards to TCFD disclosures, we know that we're not really where we should be with regards to TCFD disclosures. So there are a couple of resources that we'd like to um, highlight that could help companies to actually um, align with the TCFD recommendations. So some of these are noted here on the slide. Um, then we've got the TCFD implementation guide, we've got the good practice handbook, and then we also have e-learning courses um, um, which are available on the TCFD hub. So we're happy to even share more about this afterwards. And then uh, recently, a, a very exciting uh, paper, the Building Blocks paper, which actually helps companies to actually uh, use CDP, CDP data, because we know a lot of companies are disclosing on the CDP, and uh, together with the CDFD framework, and they can use those together to actually fulfill the TCFD recommendation. And then finally, we've got uh, just a summary of what are the key things that we think companies should actually be doing to emphasize some of the points I've highlighted. So ensuring linkages between all the content categories and actually clarifying with regards to the issues of materiality. So when to identify what is material to the business, then it's easier to know what to include within your reporting and it avoids having um, lengthy uh, descriptions with regards to climate-related issues and environmental issues. And they, again, include what is financially material in the mainstream report. This ensures that investors are able to access that information and that the information is actually shown alongside your strategic and financial information. And then as a final point, again, to highlight is that aligning the, your disclosures with the TCFD core elements is important and uh, also um, talking about the resilience of your business with regards to different climate uh, scenarios. This actually helps to actually disclose this information fully and um, in a way that investors can actually understand what, is, what are the real impacts um, from a financial point of view with regards to climate and environmental risk. Thank you, Nomte. That was really helpful and really um, sort of addresses some of the really how to and what does it look like questions we get asked all the time in the CDC Secretariat um, with regards to, to reporting. And there are many more examples on our website on the TCC Knowledge Hub and other places that Nomte referred to um, if you're looking for inspiration. So keep the questions coming along in the chat and uh, the Q&A. There's some great ones there and we will get to those. But first, I'd just like to have dip a bit more into the report and ask Fiona and Monta a few more questions. Fiona, I'm going to start with you. So this report looks at the top 50 largest European companies, as you've clarified. How do you think the findings reflect on global reporting practices more broadly? Sure, thanks, Mardi. Um, well, I guess, yeah, as, as you've 
mentioned, we kind of covered already that we decided to focus on the, the 50 largest disclosures as our kind of working hypothesis there was that as these companies are well resourced and um, they're likely to have the highest quality disclosure. So I think um, compared to the overall picture, you know, the fact that these companies um, are still having challenges uh, does kind of show that there's fundamental issues in the quality and usefulness of overall disclosure. Um, and then if we look at the, the kind of issue of the, the European region um, versus others, I guess Europe really is acknowledged to be you know, at the vanguard here and to have brought in some leading legislation, although clearly other, other jurisdictions are, are taking similar steps uh, kind of in tandem. But really, you know, Europe is, is seen one of the strongest jurisdictions. So if, if there's still challenges within Europe, I think it's fair to say, you know, that speaks to the overall global need um, for improvement. Um, and actually, quite a lot of the companies, obviously, in our review sample, given their size and, and scale, were, were multinational companies who perhaps had uh, a listing in another jurisdiction as well as, as Europe. Um, but actually, it was quite clear to see that NFRD was quite a strong driver at the moment for their climate and environmental disclosure and something that's, that's really pushing that. So I think that's positive to see, and it does show that regulation is an important driver for change. But clearly, uh, the more jurisdictions we see that bring in similar kinds of regulation, um, the better, and clearly, obviously, taking a, a universal and global approach and ideally uh, agreeing upon one standard to which we can all work would be the best means to improve kind of overall global practices. Great, that's, that's very clear. And if we look beyond T50 and the climate, how have companies incorporated environmental disclosures? Sure. So although um, we have emphasised the kind of climate aspect, aspect quite strongly in our review, we did also look at, you know, what are the environmental issues that they were disclosing, um, particularly with regards to the types of risks um, and KPIs that they were reporting on. Um, so obviously, as I've mentioned, we saw greenhouse gas emissions as the most commonly reported KPI type, but clearly uh, water-related disclosure, for example, is also uh, very much common practice. And then when we look at risk disclosures, so we did see companies addressing a wide variety of environmental risks in their disclosures. Uh, so also referencing natural capital dependencies uh, or localised pollution impacts, for example. Um, so clearly from a risk perspective, um, many are already thinking more holistically about environment. However, I think perhaps some of the areas for improvement there was really in the linkage between those different environmental uh, elements and appreciating uh, kind of the interconnectedness. So, for example, the physical impact and climate change will clearly exacerbate uh, issues in relation to some of those areas, such as water scarcity, perhaps, or, or risks of supply chain impacts from increasing frequency of natural disasters. Also, um, biodiversity and kind of natural capital concepts more broadly were only being adopted by quite a small number of companies. Um, so given the kind of growing recognition that we're seeing in the super year for nature, as it were, of those uh, kind of important aspects and, and the, the kind of unsustainable use of natural resources at the moment, um, I think it would definitely be good to see a strengthening of that more holistic understanding of natural capital and company reporting as well. Um, and really, I guess, focusing within the mainstream report on what across all of those aspects is going to be material um, for investors to know about from that company. Thanks, Fiona. Now, on to Kozo. Given your role in engaging corporates and helping them improve their own financial reporting practices, what advice would you give to companies starting out with environmental disclosures today? So I would suggest that companies actually look to understand what is financially material um, with regards to these issues, because then this will help sort of streamline uh, the disclosures that they want to make. And then I'd also suggest that companies um, think about, well, the challenge that often companies actually highlight is where to disclose the information and to think about how they can actually integrate information into their annual accounts, their mainstream reporting. So. I'd say that that's a, that's a good uh, place to start in terms of, yeah, the way they, they can start. <laughs> Super. I always say, get, you know, look at what you've already got internally as well. You look at what systems you've got in place, what data you already capture for other purposes, you know, your Absolutely. internal controls, all of those kind of, uh, many of the things we have on our get started postcards, I guess, that we, we like to share around the checklist. Uh, yeah, I think absolutely spot on. So in terms of, you know, we do hear um, from companies about a reporting burden and duplication of effort in reporting. It's often perceived, but you know, some of what Fiona has flagged up earlier in the studies around, uh, you know, 70 pages of reporting, they need they will be duplication 
within that effort. Um, and, it, and it is perceived as a problem. How can we overcome this, in your opinion? So um, um, I think that um, companies can actually start to look at the different linkages between uh, all the different uh, reporting frameworks and uh, understanding what those linkages are would actually help um, companies in, in not duplicate uh, information. And that also say that um, companies should just uh, basically focus on understanding what, what the link between the financial information and financial information. Again, it, it also limits um, duplication because then you can just uh, disclose the issues on the issues once in, in one particular report. So that's one way I think companies can actually um, address that. That's, that's really helpful. So there's a lot of information in, in this report, in this webinar today, and also in, in, in the following short reports Fiona mentioned. Given all of our competing priorities and a lengthy to-do list, what's your call to action today? What is the one thing you want our audience to walk with walk away with today based on this report and this webinar. And I'll start with you, Nantakoto. So my, my, my thought is that um, on the first, I've already mentioned that the part about materiality. So that covers the what to disclose. So understanding what is financial material in, uh, focus on that. And then I've already mentioned that part about where to disclose. So that's the second question that companies should seek to answer. And uh, for me, I. I'd like companies to take that away, as well as um, the issue of um, how to disclose. So we've mentioned that repeated, we've repeated that throughout the presentations made today, that in a, in, in a connected way, showing coherency with clarity. So I'd say that's um, very important for companies to actually be doing as they um, report going forward. And Fiona, what's your, what's your call to action? If I can be cheeky and give two, one for companies and one for investors. <laughs> Absolutely. So for investors, I think what I'd really encourage um, them to do would be to look at the good practice tips in this report and think about how they can actually provide feedback to companies directly using these insights. Um, I think that's a great way you know, to really make it clear what you need to see um, from companies, but also to give the evidence and the fodder for internal reporting teams uh, to make the case change internally. So encouraging investors to do that. Um, and then I think if I look at companies, I think my message would really be about just to keep working on improving transparency over time. You know, you don't have to be afraid to acknowledge that there's perhaps limitations in your reporting or areas to improve, um, but really just to be transparent about that and to ask your investors and other stakeholders for the feedback um, on how, how you can improve to support you on that journey. Thanks, Fiona. Now, we have, we have a long list of questions, but I thought I'd give Fiona and Nonto a break for a minute and hand the first one over to Mike. Uh, if I could bring you in, Mike, from with your policy perspective. We have a question um, asking what measures are being taken by regulators to standardize KPIs and make disclosures compulsory? And perhaps you could answer this and also touch on the non-financial reporting directive consultation as well. Thank you. Sure, happy to, uh, and I hope you can hear me all right. Um, essentially, this is a key element of, of the uh, the process of the revision of the directive, but also uh, of a broader discussion uh, within the European Commission around uh, this non-financial disclosure. So there are, of course, uh, elements of uh, standardisation that are highlighted in the consultation and the document that is currently published, and the deadline for for uh, responses until the uh, 11th of June uh, on the non-financial reporting director review, but beyond that, uh, perhaps a much more um, sort of specific development is that the uh, Commission uh, Vice President Dombrovskis has uh, requested EFRAG, the European Financial Reporting and Advisory Group, to begin preparatory work to uh, develop a European non-financial reporting standard. What this might look like is um, is for us to be seen is yet to be seen, but essentially this is a response to calls for better standardization in Europe and, and alignment of, of metrics. Now, of course, it's important that we don't end up with another uh, reporting standard in Europe. And uh, from our conversations with the Commission, they are very conscious of this as well. So hopefully, this can be uh, an opportunity to provide more specificity 
on how existing standards can be applied uh, to report in line with the non-financial reporting directive. So if you think about the directive as a set of high-level requirements, there can be a more flexible layer in the form of these non-financial reporting standards uh, refer reporting companies to, um, to you know, which standards that are they're already using or they're already out there, they might, uh, might, might apply. Um, and really, you know, just just to make a couple of points on the on the consultation as well, if I may, um, I'd encourage everyone and to to uh, respond. It's quite a lengthy consultation, but it's uh, it's it's a good opportunity to uh, provide some specific feedback on on your experience as a business, uh, where you might see uh, the pinch points and um, you know some very useful questions around standardization around alignment of policy, uh, be that EU policy or national policy, which of course is a, uh, it can be quite, uh, quite confusing and challenging to be able to uh, re respond to all of these efficiently and um, some other issues that, that are very important. So I'd encourage everyone to, to respond to that. Thanks, Mike. And, and more broadly, globally, we are seeing a real push um, by former UK Bank of England uh, Governor Mark Carney on mandatory TCFD reporting. That was he was sort of pushing that from governments around the world in the lead up to what's going to be COP this November. Now looking likely to be in the latter half of next year. Yeah, and with that, we're seeing everything from the Canadian government last week announcing that the you know, one doing bailout funding related to COVID would have to report in line with the, the task force and climate related financial disclosure recommendations. Big step forward. We're seeing real action in uh, countries like uh, change in investor investor regulations in Japan, we're seeing you know, possibly mandatory TCSD in New Zealand in the next few weeks. There is a real push for, um, and the UK government's talking about, you know, how they can make it happen. The ministers were meeting a few weeks ago on this topic. There's a real push to drive um, compulsory uh, disclosures on environmental information globally. So, um, you know, if, if companies aren't reporting now, I would be, you're starting to be prepared for this to be mandatory. Um, in the next, certainly in the next few years in, in many large jurisdictions around the world. Um, now, I'm going to ask Fiona if she could tackle the next question. Um, did CDSB integrate corporate CDP responses in, into this, this study? Sure. So, um, I think as I mentioned at the start, our starting point with the review was the mainstream report. Um, and then to answer the question set about the different NFRD content categories and the TCFD response elements, um, we reviewed other information only if it was necessary to directly find the information to answer those questions, and really only if it clearly referenced and signposted to from the mainstream report. So in instances where that was the case, and for example, some companies pointed to their CDP response for their scenario analysis outputs, we would have reviewed that, but only where it was, was clearly done. And I think the reasons for that is really that the, the emphasis of both the non-financial reporting directive and of the TCFD is on the integration of you know, material and decision use information for investors into that mainstream annual report so that it's connected to financial information and so that it's um, prepared in, with the same processes as, as financial information. So I think that's the reason for that emphasis. But I know um, it links quite closely actually to the topic of our event from last week where we were launching our guidance on uh, using CDP and TCFD and CDFD framework together and clearly that is uh, something that uh, hopefully that guidance will support with. Um, so really I think the way we frame that is that the, the CDP data is an incredibly valuable way to collect and formulate the information that you then need to integrate within your mainstream report um, in order to produce effective TCFD disclosure. So I um, would encourage people to take a look at that report as well if they wanted to, to know more about that area. Thanks, Fiona. Now I'm going to um, quickly take one myself. There's a question here about, um, do we, is there an update on the timeline for the WEF IBC project on common metrics launched at Davos this year? Um, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm no expert on this, I am aware that there'll be a meeting in late in August when this will be finalised, but the consultation there is a public consultation on at the moment, and I think that closes very soon, either last week or this week. Um, but there will be someone probably that knows better, so do pop it in the chat. And I think they do have a meeting scheduled for late August. So um, I was under the impression from my last uh, conversations with my WEF friends that that was when that was going to be released. 
but um, yeah, you'd be best to just loop back with uh, Catherine Brown at WEF, who could probably uh, give you a better update than me. Now, Mike, um, can I hand this one to you? Is there an analysis about workforce engaged in this type of work? Um, when you were alone, you cannot do it as any or Total have done it. A very fair question, um, and I'm happy to say that the Commission is, has actually commissioned a study to look specifically into this issue, uh, both in terms of the staff capacity needed and also the cost of reporting. They are very uh, conscious about a proportionality of, of uh, resources needed uh, to report, so this is something very, they're very conscious of. On the other hand, it's also important to take into account the activity of a certain business. So. Um, the current definitions of uh, of the directive, uh, you know, the require that, that that define which companies captured are uh, the number of employees that is uh, 500 employees or up, uh, and or to the following net turnover of over 40 million euros, or the average uh, or the balance sheet total is over 20 million euros. So we're not talking about tiny companies; we're talking about large companies. Having said that. Um, there might be companies that are, are relatively small but have much more uh, dependency on, on these matters or risks or exposures or uh, a much larger impact. So uh, the Commission is also looking at whether there is there are other considerations to take into account when deciding which company should report. But they are very conscious about this and um, many companies will have been contacted uh, directly to get feedback so that this is the policy making decisions. Thanks, Mike. Now, we've had a couple of questions in that sort of linked to audit, so I'm going to try and package them up together, and then I'm going to ask the panel who would like to respond. Um, so one of them is, do you recommend the voluntary auditing of non-financial reports, or is there no value added by a limited or reasonable assurance as the audit auditing standards are not aligned? And so similarly linked to that, um, do we see new auditing requirements for these project-specific requirements, such as social or biodiversity issues? given the challenge on comment data and technical skills in the audit sector. Um, and I think we have to consider that. Um, now, this is my personal take in line with sort of the uh, um, IAASB's EER consultation that's out at the moment, which is sort of looking at how to assure this sort of um, from, from this sort of information. So, Mike, Fiona, Nonto, who'd like to take this one? No volunteers. Um, yeah, well, I guess um, I'll just I'll just give my take, I suppose, but um, be interested in Mike's thoughts as well. I think um, you know overall, I think what we say in the CDSB framework is that whilst uh, clearly there isn't an overall consensus on the need for, for direct verification and audit of, of non-financial information at the moment, but there is a need, you know, for it to be prepared in a consistent and comparable way. So I think the emphasis that the CDSB places on it there is really on preparing it as though it would be assured or audited regardless of of perhaps what practices are currently required or, or recommended because uh, clearly you want it to go through those same controls of financial information um, that it's presented alongside so that you know you have the confidence there that, that that's robust um, clearly you know having stronger uh, accounting standards and, and audit standards in this space would, would very much support that um, I guess audit's not something that we're addressing in the first instance, but uh, accounting standards, I guess, is a precursor to that. It's something we're very much uh, actively looking at at the moment. Um, a little plug for our, uh, our current subgroups that we're uh, working to form uh, on accounting standards related to climate change. So we, yeah, we absolutely see the need for, for greater standards in this space, and, and I guess the integration of climate change more clearly, so that um, it's clear for companies where where. Um, Climate change should be integrated both under existing standards and and new ones if they're required. So um, obviously that would then follow through over time it's to audit. But yes, I think from my perspective, uh, always good to take that same approach even if it's not required at the moment. But I'm not sure if Mike perhaps might have anything else to add on that. Just another one of those topics to highlight that the Commission is looking at very uh, thoroughly. Um, they do seem to have a, a uh, they do seem to see the benefits of auditing. Uh, an important thing to consider is obviously you audit against the standard, so uh, there needs to be a standard in place. You know uh, the the uh, the CLB framework itself is is uh, assurance ready, 
Um, but whether that sort of satisfies the Commission's uh, needs, for example, is 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 uh, to be determined. But but they are very they they seem to be um, uh, quite quite in favour. At, at least my my personal take on this is is that they see a lot of benefit to perhaps strengthening some uh, assurance uh, requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And WBCSD, along with COSO uh, in the US, have done some work specifically on this topic. So I urge you to go on to the Redefining Value section of the World Business Council Sustainable Development website if this is something you're interested in. And they have a whole body of work there that um, may also help you know, with your thinking and your practice. Um, but they do, as I said, the IAASB do currently have a consultation out on this matter. So uh, do, do have a look at engage with that. Now, last question before um, as we come up to the hour, and again, I uh, will leave this to the to uh, my colleagues to decide who would answer. How are in-house investor relations teams and external analysts and in, um, external analysts and investors engaged in guiding development of reports and reporting practice? Uh, I can give my take on that one if you'd like. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. I think um, personally, I attended a event uh, back in life before lockdown, seems so distant, but um, an event um, focused on investor relations back in December in London, and I think that was fascinating because it was a room of you know over 100 IR professionals all looking at ESG integration, and actually climate change and environment came through very strongly in that audience. as something that they they very much see. You know, as part of their job and as part of the concerns of investor relations. So I think that's something that's, that's probably changed a little in, in recent years where, um, you know, in my, my old uh, hat as a sustainability professional in-house, you, you sometimes have to, to work quite hard to get uh, investor relations interest in these topics. So I think that that's certainly changing. Um, you know, as the primary communicators to investors within a company, I think, you know, they've got a very important role uh, to play and, and I guess really working in an interdisciplinary way between sustainability teams who perhaps have the topic specific knowledge and, and investor teams who really know how to communicate best to their investors um, is really needed to, to get that right. So yeah, just very much collaborating um, between the two. And indeed, uh, where we reference external analysts as well, getting their, their feedback and, and views on how you can improve their reporting as well as I mentioned before in terms of the tips, I think it can be really helpful. Thanks. Yeah, no, that was really good. And I can just say from our personal perspective, I remember all those years ago when we, when Mike and I were seeking to influence the non-financial reporting directive when it was set up. Um, and I'm probably aging us here unnecessarily, Mike, I'm sorry. But we, uh, we, we then, I know the Commission found it very difficult to get investor feedback on the development of the regulation at that particular point in time, the development of the directive. Very, very difficult. And I, I would say, um, that is one of the audiences we struggle most from and we, we put our framework and papers out for consultation. It is an area where we, we do work very hard to try and get feedback on, but one, we do actually struggle to get it in. So, um, but I do know the investor community has been very, very active in the development of the EU taxonomy and many of the new green finance products um, in, across, in and across Europe and also more specific um, financial sort of products here across London, for uh, in London, for example. So. I think they are getting more and more engaged into this, you know, I think across the last five, six years, the sort of level of engagement is definitely ramping up, um, which I think is a, is a very, very good sign. So thank you very much for your questions. I think we've just about got through all of them. Um, <laughs> all of them today. If we haven't got to your question, please don't hesitate to drop us an email to info at cdsb.net and we'll get it um, answered and um, answered to you soon. The, the webinar today will, is recorded. It will be available on our website as long as the slides and any key links. Um, tomorrow we are launching, for those of you that are, are trying to implement the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, we're launching a freely available 45-minute uh, training course on the TCFD Knowledge Hub, which we power at CDSB, on what is the directive and how to go about implementing it. We hope you find that useful. It's CPD accredited, so log on there. Later in the summer, we also have um, uh, we have, uh, one on uh, climate governance and one on climate risk that we're doing the Global Association of Risk Management Professionals GARP. So um, we encourage you to keep looking on this. The new ones, we already have um, TCFD, sort of interested TCFD related ones on there. So really exciting and useful resource for you. 
uh, to look at. And also Nanta Kozo, who on the call today, she's also um, reaching out to uh, companies across Europe to support them on their environmental and climate reporting. Um, and, and she's just doing it to have a, a conversation about what people are doing to help build up our, uh, I guess, our engagement practice to so say what sort of tools we could helpfully uh, produce or webinars we could run or training sessions to help companies um, really start to you know move forward and step up so we're not falling short next time round uh, with reporting. So if you are um, one of those companies, please do that would like uh, had to have a chat with Nonto. Please do get in touch. She'd be more than happy to you know loop back with you and uh, give you some advice. So um, we're at the hour. Thank you very much for joining us today um, for our webinar that's been hosted um, with my CDSB colleagues, which is lovely, and also with the, uh, the generous support of the Life Program of the European Union. So as I said, all the information is on the website. Send your questions through, and uh, we have a, a very engaging program of webinars that we run. So do uh, have a look on our website. Sign up to some more. Um, just before I go, uh, as we sign off from this webinar, there is uh, a survey that will pop up, um, which gives us some feedback on this. Please do take the time to fill it in, so we do know what what you want to hear, what we can do better next time. Um, yeah, it's it's good learning for all of us. So thank you very much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you, and I look forward to uh, joining you again soon. Thank you very much, everyone. The CDSB thanks the EU Life Programme for making this launch event possible.